My name is Andy Dunham, uh, and my wife and I have had Grinnell Heritage Farm. Uh, I started the farm business in 2006. Uh, we got married in 2007, and we grew in a stepwise fashion from about three acres of produce that first year um, all the way up to there's all the way up to um, about the biggest we ever got for produce was about 25 acres of certified organic produce. Uh, that we sold uh, mostly through uh, a CSA, uh, some wholesale, some farmers markets over the years. Uh, and for any of you who have farmed, you know that you know you kind of add and subtract enterprises as uh, your labor needs change or your labor availability changes, um, and what's selling and what's not selling. So we've done a plethora of different things, from cut flowers to um, fruit, different fruits and vegetables, uh, nuts, uh, livestock like cattle and chickens. Um, I think what else we do, wood-fired pizza nights on the farm, a uh, number of different enterprises that we've added and subtracted over the years. Um, this is an aerial view of our farm, and so you're kind of looking to the north and east. Uh, this is a drone picture that a neighbor took. Um, and can you see my cursor when I put that over the screen, Maggie? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so this is our packing shed uh, right here, and we have uh, just one greenhouse and one high tunnel. And you can see the vegetable fields were relatively flat. Um, down here was a rotationally grazed cattle um, from years past. We had a hay field over here. Uh, and the farm kind of goes um, further to the west and hits a railroad track. We're, we're relatively close to town and on a paved road. Uh, this is the two acre chestnut field up in this corner. And you can see our vegetable beds stand out uh, quite nicely. We get a lot of helicopter traffic uh, just because we're interesting to look at. Um, this is a shot, uh, a different, uh, I think it's a different time, but kind of above the vegetable field. So here again is the chestnut field. This is our packing facility, um, the greenhouse and high tunnel, and then uh, all of the vegetable fields. Um, we ended up going uh, back in 2006. I, re I, wasn't, I wasn't really interested in farming um, part-time or subsidizing my farm with off-farm income, uh, which tends to happen quite often, I guess. And I am now transitioning to that, which is something I didn't really want to do. So uh, you may have overheard if you were on earlier, uh, TD and I talking about, we just very recently made the decision to scale back our farm operation. And so um, it wasn't something that we were really anticipating doing. We, we actually had sold and our CSA sales were on uh, target, if not slightly above our historical average which is kind of bucking a national trend. Most, uh, most CSA farms are struggling uh, with CSA retention. Uh, what we were noticing was a precipitous decline in wholesale um, income. And so uh, some two of our largest accounts um, uh, had definitely didn't have the best years in 2019. And we ended up getting some correspondence with them that, that led us to believe that um, uh, putting crop in the ground, expecting to sell it at, in certain places was probably a very bad business decision. And so when we reran those, our figures, um, uh, we just kind of punched in what we thought were, were more realistic numbers. And we determined that even if we had a spectacular growing season, which we have not had for the last three years, um, that we wouldn't, there really was no way we could see that we wouldn't go backwards this year. And uh, over the last three years, uh, if you average them together, we've gone backwards each year for the last three, but 2018 was really kind of our kick in the pants. Um, and we just determined that the where we were sitting financially, debt-wise and income-wise, and what our labor expenditures were, and what we foresaw the markets being, um, we decided it was better to, to just cut our losses now rather than to soldier on and cut larger losses later. Um, so I'm just, I'm giving kind of that backstory because I know at least within PFI, um, there's definitely been some talk of it. Uh, it's kind of shocking to my system. I fully expected to go into this season farming full time and I'm currently applying for off farm jobs. Uh, but having had some of the correspondence since, uh, we feel very much that we made the right decision. So, um, that aside, I'm going to move on from that now. Um, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, 
So this is an old slide that I've used in other presentations. I pulled it because I think it's kind of pertinent, especially considering the number that my wife and I kind of looked at over the past week. Uh, when you talk about weed management, um, like vegetable system, the key is to hit hit very. Um, uh, you want to hit very specific windows, um, and so if you miss a window the tool that you thought you might be able to use probably isn't going to work or isn't going to be as effective. And so it's nice to have a lot of tools in your toolbox, uh, but each one of those tools costs money and you have to be able to store it and maintain it and know how to operate it. And so this slide, I'm not really gonna go over it, but um, it'll be recorded in the Farminar. And if it's something you'd be interested in looking at later, uh, you can certainly pull that up and pause that screen. Um, but just making sure that you're buying equipment that's, that's useful to you now and into the future that you're not putting yourself in a financial position um, uh, to not be able to pay for it and or use it properly? Um, and is there like another alternative um, that you could be you know, using rather than buying steel? Um, most farm equipment does not appreciate. So uh, there are rare exceptions. And uh, if I knew what they were in advance, I'd probably be buying more of those things. Um, but it's, it's kind of a good rule of thumb um, it's a good rule of thumb to not expect to recoup what you put into it. So uh, when we're selling a lot of our stuff right now, we kind of have like what our replacement insurance cost is. And now like we're kind of going through our spreadsheet and saying, this is how much money we can actually get for something like this. And it is definitely not the replacement insurance value. It's lower. So um, this is another slide that I think I've used in another PFI um, presentation, maybe at the annual conference. Um, and I find that this, our, our overall um, weed management strategy hasn't changed too terribly much. Uh, if you've been on my farm in the last couple of years, we've been weedier than I have wanted to be, in part because um, the labor market has shifted underneath us here in central Iowa. Um, labor costs are about a time and a half what they were per, for, per hour, and the willing labor pool has shrunk drastically. And so we've been, um, for the last three years, really kind of under our labor force has been smaller than we really wanted it to be. Um, but it just, you know, it's just the circumstances that we found ourselves in. So we had more weeds than we wanted to in part because we couldn't hit some of those windows. Um, so this one I will go over a little bit more. So the first thing is, is like, where are your weeds coming from? You know, are, and are weed seeds blowing into the field? Is your potting soil dirty? Is your mulch coming in clean? You know, are you, planting crop seed that has noxious weed seed in it? Like, are you getting oats from a neighbor that has cockleburrs in the, or, you know, has, or, you know, getting rye straw or something with giant ragweed seed in it? Um, your field borders and field roads, if they aren't mowed appropriately, can be a source. Um, and is it coming from, which definitely happened. We, as our wildlife habitat has increased over the years, we've noticed that we're having a lot more, um, uh, trees come up in our fields, like mulberries and some of those things, and it's actually coming from the birds. Um, and that can, especially as we've switched, we've actually switched more to no-till over the years, and that has led to actually having at times that we actually have to go out and like dig trees out of the field, even just with a single, after a single season. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do without needing specialized tools. So, um, you know, you can, you, if you're using a rototiller or a spader or something like that, you can change the timing, the depth, when you're tilling, is it wet or not? You can switch to no-till if you have that equipment. Uh, your crop rotation is actually, actually quite important. Um, like it's not usually in a vegetable system beneficial to follow something like onions, which require a very clean field. Um, like you wouldn't really want to, to put your onions after a crop that had weed pressure in it. And I'm thinking like on our farm, our beets always kind of got weedy because we usually relied on mechanical cultivation and the in-row mechanical cultivation on beets was a little tough uh, to get down pat. Um, and so I would never choose to put onions into a field that I knew had heavy weed seed pressure. Um, your timing of planting can matter. So if you know that you have summer annual weeds um, in a certain field, maybe that's where you want to put an early spring crop that will come out about the time that those get going or vice versa. Like if you have a, um, you know, if you have a, um, a field that has a lot of spring annual or winter, or winter annual weeds in it, maybe you'd like to eliminate those and then plant later in the season. Uh, or you might just want to flush the weeds a little bit um, and then do a tillage pass and then plant. 
Uh, we only use drip irrigation, not necessarily because that's the best option in all circumstances, but uh, we had very limited water resources where we are. We're at the top of our watershed. Um, the nice thing about drip irrigation um, is that you don't have to water your, your wheel tracks and you can really target where your um, water goes. So like for onions, for example, we actually plant, we bury our drip tape right under a row of onions. Um, and then, so we're planting the onions right on top of the drip tape, basically, and we're only watering the onions. So if it's a dry year, the weeds don't really do much of anything in between the rows. Um, your crop selection and location can matter. I kind of touched on the location. Um, certain varieties do better um, with weed pressure than others. Um, mulch can be used. You can use plastic or straw or leaves or any of those sorts of things, depending on what you have available. Um, Cultivation helps, so you know, hoes, harrows, discs, basket weeders, all sorts, finger weeders, all those sorts of things, and flame. Um, you, know, you can flame your carrots and parsnips, for example, or you can run your flame weeder down your row of onions. Um, you can bury your weed seeds. So I have in the past, I had um, a strawberry field that got kind of weedy on me, and I moldboard plowed it um, and just buried the weed seed that was there. Uh, if you don't have too many brassicas in your um, uh, so like anything in the mustard family, um, you can use, you can till them under for biofumigation. I'm not an expert on that. Um, we have, we grew so many brassicas like broccoli, cabbage, and kale that putting a brassica cover crop down wasn't, was not part of our rotation. Um, you can use cover crops and we started utilizing those more as the labor market um, uh, kind of became tighter. And so we started choosing our weediest fields and we scaled back our operation a few acres and we chose the worst of the weedy fields and we would put those into cover crop um, for a whole year, which is kind of the concept of cover fallow. Um, and that's just, you know, some of those, those annual weeds like foxtail are not particularly long lived if you can break that cycle. And so if you, just a single year, you might knock your foxtail pressure back quite a lot. Uh, and we did transplant a lot. So in an organic system, transplanting is, is really there as much as anything to get you a jump on the weeds. Uh, if you direct seed uh, broccoli crop into a weedy field, you will really, really struggle to get it weeded. But if you transplant a broccoli crop into a weedy field, um, it actually can be pretty easy um, if, you, if you hit those windows appropriately to keep it clean. Um, and you need to admit when you have problems. Uh, we had some problems the last few years for sure. Do we need to change management practices? If that's the case, then, then try to do that. Uh, do you need to buy more equipment? That may or may not help. Um, if you have fertility issues, that can lead to weed problems. So um, having excessive nitrogen might lead to like really strong stands of um, amaranth or lamb's quarter. Um, so, you know, do your soil tests and, you know, identify where you're hauling your fertilizer and or compost or manure or whatever you're using. Um, keep records so you can kind of tell what's worked and what hasn't. Um, also helps if you have weedy compost or manure um, and you know where you hauled it, you'll be able to figure out if maybe that's where some of your problems are coming from. And I have brought weeds in from uh, buying hay from the neighbor. Uh, so we ended up um, creating some of our own problems by, by trying to mulch with, with hay and straw that was a little on the weedy side. Uh, if a crop's weedy, assess it and call it a loss if necessary. I got to be way better at that the longer I farmed. Um, and it's kind of, you get kind of a feel for it after a while. And sometimes you can tell almost after the first cultivation. And so I have been known to even transplant a crop out, cultivate it, and the cultivation, like maybe the soil conditions were just terrible and like the plants didn't look that great and I didn't get a good weed kill. I've been known to just be like, all right, we're gonna call that a loss now so we can replant. Um, and the crew sometimes would be like, oh, what are we doing? We just did all that work. But, you know, ad ad addressing a weedy field for the whole season is often more work than just calling it a loss. Um, I've also made the mistake of not doing that and regretted it pretty much every time. Uh, you can hire more people in. Um, so in 2015, it was really, really wet and we missed a whole bunch of mechanical cultivations in early on. And so we hired extra people to come in and help us clean stuff up by hand. Um, that was kind of before the labor market really tightened up, and that was not really available to us um, the last three or four years. Uh, you can seek expert advice, so ask people who know more about it than you. Um, they tend to be willing to give you advice. If, um, if you're going to talk to any farmer, at least me, 
Uh, I find this kind of be true though. Like anybody who's doing this for a long time, one of our favorite things to do is to kill weeds. And so if you ask us, how do I kill more weeds? We usually will go on ad nauseum. Uh, if weeds do go to seed, uh, I have found that it's better to leave your soil undisturbed in the fall. Uh, Matt Liebman at Iowa State, who has won a number of awards for his work in sustainable agriculture, including um, at least one award for PFI, uh, has done a lot of research at Iowa State uh, talking about how much rodents uh, will eat uh, in weed seed throughout the winter months so long as it's not tilled under. And he is on to something. It definitely helps. So I'm going to go into kind of how... I haven't seen any questions yet. I'm trying to monitor that. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit into how we deal with it, deal with weeds or have dealt with weeds. Um, and when I scale back our farming operation, I still, I'm still going to farm. I'm just going to be farming with off-farm income and, and benefits, I'm hoping. Um, and so I'll still get to do this on a much smaller scale. And I have a feeling I'm actually going to really enjoy gardening at a smaller scale because those windows won't be so tight. There's a big difference between hitting a window on, you know, 20 some odd acres kill weeds versus maybe being able to go out and hoe everything in a day. Um, and that's not possible at that larger scale. So it, some of the pressure will be off when I shift into some new, uh, when I shift, shift how we, we plan our farm. So the biggest thing is to have a plan. And so we have a seeding schedule. So we have a, we have a Excel spreadsheet that, that my wife designed. Um, and I kind of took over management of that, but she definitely set it up. And the idea was, is that we could kind of figure out, um, you know, we'd figure out when we were planning to seed, how much we were going to seed. So if it was direct seeded or how many flats we'd put in, we'd have a transplant projection. Um, and that kind of allowed me to figure out how do we hit these windows where we have the chance to get all that, all that field work done on 20 some odd acres with maybe four people on staff or five people on staff or whatever it was and still, you know, still have a chance to get everything done. So this kind of allows you to play with dates and move things around without having to do it all in a notebook. Um, uh, so this is kind of how we'd start. We'd have, um, have a plan. So I see that Maggie's already responded to Carl's. Um, yeah, Matt, Matt Liebman is definitely more, um, uh, more of an expert on this than I am. So I would certainly refer to his research over my anecdotes. So we have a plan and then you start implementing it by starting transplants in the greenhouse. So in our greenhouse, we had a, a 3000 square foot greenhouse. It was just a relatively inexpensive one that we bought from farm tech. Um, the, you know, we had heat in the greenhouse. Um, we'd start transplants from seed and we usually started about 500,000 plants a year from seed. And then we'd set most of those out. Some would go for sale too, but most of them would get, would get set out on our own farm. And the transplanting is, to get, is as much as anything to get a jump on the weeds. It's way faster to direct seed, but it's almost impossible with Iowa weather to be able to manage all of that and stay ahead of it without, I mean, if you're using a lot of herbicides, maybe. And I think it'd even be challenging in a, in a conventional situation using herbicide to, to, in Iowa, at least, to have a diversified vegetable operations operation and not use transplants. Um, transplants get hardened off. This is quite an old picture. We used to put everything out in, on pallets. Um, we kind of shifted as we grew more and more. We switched over to, I'm going to jump back a slide. But you see these tubes. These are PVC tubes um, that we made. And so two people can carry eight flats in and out of the greenhouse at a time. It saves a ton of labor in the spring for hardening off. Like when, when you have those days when you need to get your plants out to harden them off and nighttime temperatures are too cold to leave them out, you can, two people can move, you know, 500 flats of plants in and out relatively quickly. Um, I'll have those for sale. Shameless plugging. Um, we put them on pallets at times, but we also started utilizing hay racks. And so for onions and things that we can transplant really quickly, we just fill a hay rack and pull the whole hay rack out into the field at a, at a time. So you didn't have to even go back and forth with pallets on the tractor. Um, oftentimes when we had a bigger crew, if I was taking two pallets onions at a time, I would just drive tractor while they planted. And by the time I got out there, they'd already planted two more pallets. So 
Uh, and then you go out to the field and we had a water wheel transplanter that we used for a lot of stuff. Some things like onions, we would just set out by hand by throwing the transplant on, onto a marked line and pushing it in so that your rows were still straight for cultivation. Um, other plants we'd set out with a water wheel transplanter. And here you can see us, this is from years and years ago, um, putting, my beard hadn't gone gray yet, uh, putting out, it looks like to me, squash, probably squash transplants and squ direct seeded squashes. Um, and that's a field. So there you also get to see the mulch. So using plastic mulch, we used plastic mulch on uh, probably a, few, a couple acres or so. We usually did it for our sweet potato. We always did it for our sweet potatoes, um, our cucurbits, uh, tomatoes, um, peppers, things that needed a little extra heat and or help with the weeds. Uh, you could, so this is something that we utilized later. This is a large round bale grinder that we bought. Um, and this would allow for one or two people, uh, typically two, to, I'd have one person, usually me, loading bales with a bale spear into the back, and then it grinds it up and shoots it out the side and somebody else would grind and shoot. So there were times that we would actually mulch in between the rows to help, um, that was in part to suppress weeds, and, but also to conserve moisture and build soil organic matter. Um, as our labor tightened up, we got away from that a little bit because it, the timing of it didn't work as well as I wanted to, but we still used it for mulching our, our, um, our strawberries and our garlic. And the nice thing about it was it spit it up just nicely enough that you, like if, you, if you roll big bales out over a, bed of, uh, over a field of garlic, you have to kind of go through in the spring and pull the mulch back or they, get, um, or they end up getting smothered out or they can get you know, stuck under the mulch and grow sideways for a time. Um, the nice thing about this, the, the chewed up mulch is that uh, the garlic would just poke right through and it made for a much cleaner field because you didn't have that little strip of weeds germinating right down uh, the row of garlic where you'd pulled it back. Uh, and the same thing for the, for the strawberries, they seem to come up through that. I mean, you could just kind of go through and rake it off real lightly. Um, and it seemed to help suppress some of the weeds uh, going into the next year. So that's a, that's a Teagle Tomahawk uh, bale grinder. That's what it looked like when I bought it. Um, actually still looks pretty good. Uh, we used this, this is a new picture of one of these, but this is a Williams tool system. Um, the answer to that, what's the maker of that kind of bale chopper? It's a Teagle Tomahawk, T-E-A-G-L-E, -E, I think. Pretty sure, I don't think the E is before the L. Uh, Teagle Tomahawk. Um, this is a Williams tool system. That, uh, are, they're still available, they're pretty versatile. Um, they have uh, these adjustable um, tines. So it's a, you can use it for like blind cultivation as a blind harrow. Um, so I, we would use this a lot if we hit the windows right on onions or potatoes or brassicas or something, you would just put all of these down fairly aggressively and run over the crop in both directions at, in road gear. And it would flick the little weeds out. So you had to do it when the, right before you, like the, the field couldn't look weedy. Um, you had to, um, uh, you had to do it before the field looked weedy because otherwise it, it usually didn't work all that well. So it was at that white hair stage. And typically for most transplants in our soils, it was about, about 10 days after transplant. If, there was a, if, if you got them either watered in or rained in, they would be rooted well enough to be able to take it. Um, in a dry season, you might have to wait longer um, because they might not have rooted yet. And if it was super wet, it didn't work at all. Um, so you had, to, you had the soil, like it had to have been kind of damp. And then as, when the soil starts to kind of change color as it dries out, that's about the best time to use this tool. Um, and you could put these side knives on it. So you could, you could lift it up in the air behind your tractor. You could flip these. These were flipped to be a row marker. So here you can see we were marking for three rows um, to throw, probably to throw onions out. Um, but you could flip these so that they would swoop in underneath the canopy of a crop. So this might be pointed towards the center with a shank on the outside. And you could mount wheel sweeps right behind your tractor right here, which are not included in this picture. Uh, this tool we used a lot. So I would say um, for about three weeks in the spring, this was just always hooked up. And if the soil condition was right, we would stop whatever, one person, whatever they're doing, and just drive like a maniac back and forth across the field with this. Um, one of the things you need if you're going to have proper weed control are, and you're going to do it mechanically, is need straight lines. 
So um, we seeded a lot of stuff um, with this. This is a three-row stand hay. It's a punch belt planter, so it's relatively old technology. Um, but it, the nice thing is it's mechanical, so you can work on it yourself. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. It's reliable. Uh, so we seeded all our carrots, beets, parsnips, rutabaga, turnips. Oh, I'm trying to think what else we did with that. Um, basically, anything we planted where we wanted a singulated seed, so it actually, so like you plant pelleted carrot seed and it will singulate it so you don't have to thin them. Same thing with parsnips. Um, and it places it exactly in the row with the spacing that you want. So if you want all your carrots to be an inch apart, you can, you can have made for you that belt or, you know, they're kind of standard. So we have quite a few of those. Um, and we, we had fantastic success with this. Theater. It's a really, really nice tool to have at your disposal. And it makes cultivating a lot easier because your drive, you know, your rows are, are perfectly parallel to each other. Um, and when you're driving, so this is, you spend a lot of time looking like this. This tractor has a cab. All the rest of our tractors pretty much did not. Um, but you spend a lot of time looking out the front, driving in really long straight lines. Um, and the key I find for a lot of mechanical cultivations, if you can keep your lines pretty straight, um, you know, we're not utilizing GPS, although I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty close even for small scale growers as um, some of the older GPS uh, tractor units um, kind of come out of usage in larger farms. I think we'll be able to get those on the secondary market. Um, but as long as you keep your rows relatively straight, you can, you can do a pretty good job of cultivating mechanically. Um, and so we have two of these tractors. Um, this is a Farmall 140, which are the old tobacco cultivating tractors that were predominantly, you still can find them in the south. Um, and so we have one that has a basket weeder, a two-row basket weeder mounted underneath, and another one has a two-row finger weeder mounted underneath. Um, this one is the one with the basket weeder, but the picture I'm going to show you doesn't have the basket weeder. So the basket weeder are, are these rolling baskets and the, they're geared. So the front roll at a different speed than the back and it helps to disrupt the soil surface in between your rows without burying small seeded things like carrots and beets. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the back basket kind of throws those fine hair, like white hair roots up typically and they'll, they'll desiccate. Um, I do see a question about thoughts about black plastic recycling. Um, yeah, pla plastic is terrible and no, we used to be able to do it and they stopped doing it about seven or eight years ago. And so it goes in the landfill now. I don't know of anyone doing it up in Wisconsin. They still buy, um, people will still go around and buy it to incinerate it. So they'll buy like silage tarp bags and things like that. And people will burn those. Um, I don't know of anybody doing that in Iowa either. So ours ends up going in the landfill probably like most other people's. Um, on this particular tractor, I took the basket off and I had a garlic crop that was kind of, wasn't very clean. And so I wanted to go in and cultivate it. And so I put a great big sweep on the front and put my wheel sweeps down and was able to in about 45 minutes do what would have taken a crew of 10 people, you know, a day um, to weed. I'm going to touch on cover crops. I see your note, Maggie, about five minutes to go, and we're about on track. Um, cover cropping is a great way to suppress weeds. Um, so this is a cover crop of rye and vetch with the kale field in the back. Um, the rye has an allelopathic effect, and so it can suppress weed seed germination. And then it also helps to shade them out and outcompete them. Um, this, is a field of a, this is a field of spinach that we had maybe two years ago. And in the background, you can see a stand of sorghum sedan grass behind my bales. Um, and I used a, a fair bit of sorghum sedan grass in our rotation in part to suppress root knot nematodes um, in our carrots and parsnips. They don't apparently like uh, whatever uh, microbial activity is happening in sorghum sedan grass roots. But sorghum sedan grass can build an awful lot of soil organic matter um, and can basically take up all available nitrogen. And it is great pheasant habitat. I really enjoy um, having the wildlife on the farm. We have about 20 mature adult pheasants on the farm right now. Um, and we're predominantly cropped. Uh, so we use that quite a bit. Um, in our asparagus, we would always uh, do a light tillage pass and broadcast or drill soybeans to help suppress weeds and fix a bit of nitrogen. And ultimately, you're wanting a field that's relatively clean. So you can see here, we went through and roged out some of the bigger weeds on this end. This is a field of about an acre of peppers that was pretty clean. And you can get a nice crop out of that. 
There's a really nice clean field of carrots next to one of our beetle banks. Um, you know, you can get pretty good results if you, if you can kind of time everything properly. Um, there was a question about how, um, what do you do about the mulch on the garlic? Do you remove it and how? And no, we don't remove it. It just stays in place. Uh, when we harvest our garlic, we just run an underminer. So like we have like a, a toolbar with a, like a piece of road grader blade welded between two shanks. Um, that allows us to undercut to about 10 inches deep. So garlic is not that deep. So you usually only have to go about five or six inches deep. And it slightly lifts the soil and loosens, loosens it enough. You can just grab the, the necks and pull up and the garlic pop out of the ground, and then we bundle them together to cure in the greenhouse. But we just leave the mulch in place. And then I usually, if it's clean, I would go in and no-till um, no -till a cover crop into that. Or if it's kind of weedy, I might do a light tillage pass and then plant a cover crop. And I see somebody posted something about agricultural plastic waste. Although I see it's from 2015. So we're five years, or four and a half years removed from that. So. From there, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out and I'll be around for questions later. I'm gonna mute my um, microphone and I'm passing it on to you, TD, good luck. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, hopefully everybody can hear me. Yep, you're good, TD. All right, All right. can you see everything? Uh... As far as the yep. slideshow here? All right, yep. perfect. All right, well, my name is uh, TD Hollow. Uh, I run Garden Oasis Farm. Uh, we're outside of Coggin, uh, Iowa here. And um, I'll, I kind of took a little bit different approach. Um, so this is gonna be really just my situation, what I use, what's worked well for me. And um, definitely, if you have any questions along the way, please um, just send it and I will uh, try to address them as we go here. But, um, so we started in 2013. Um, I graduated from the University of Iowa with a, a degree in health and human physiology. And I grew up on a family farm. We were mainly corn and soybeans, um, and had cattle and hogs, and just always loved living on the farm and just wanted to kind of figure out you know, what it is that I could do that would get me back there, but didn't need hundreds and hundreds of acres to um, be able to make a living. So we uh, decided that vegetables would maybe be a good option and it would uh, also work with the uh, nutrition and just realizing a lot of people don't have access to uh, the food that they need. So this is kind of where our farm began. But our first, first garden was about a half acre. Um, it was really just a bunch of everything. Um, we just wanted to see kind of what would grow and, and what uh, grew well on our soil and what we enjoyed growing. So it was kind of just an experimental year. Um, so fast forward a couple of years in 2015, uh, kind of took the big leap and that's when I moved up to about five acres uh, in vegetable production and right now uh, we grow um, about eight acres worth of vegetables and our total farm is about 10 acres. We have three high tunnels one of which I am currently building. I uh, had two kits that I purchased and put up um, and then talking with a farm friend decided that uh, I was going to try and build my own with a uh, hoop bender and I'm in the process of completing a 14 by 60 foot little high tunnel to just kind of help us grow some more lettuce and greens and things like that. Um, sorry. Uh, we do a CSA. Uh, we sell to a few local restaurants, uh, three farmers markets and then some different wholesale outlets and then New Pioneer Food Co-op is kind of one of our, our uh, newer uh, buyers in the last few years. So um, I'm just going to kind of go through and do the steps of, of what we do on our farm uh, to kind of make everything work. Uh, recently we've had a lot better luck with controlling weeds than I had in the past. Um, I think part of that is due to um, me just figuring more things out and then also 
um, a little bit more confidence and then uh, get a little bit more aggressive with the tools that I have. Uh, so the first thing that we, we kind of do, we always start with a cover crop. Um, some of the ones that I like are just a straight uh, winter rye. We'll do a rye vetch. Uh, my, my favorite one that starred there is oats, peas, clover, and vetch. Um, just had a really nice luck with that. Uh, the oats and peas will winter kill uh, along with some of the clovers and then the vetch will kind of persist along with um, a couple clovers. I usually mix about three or four different clovers together. Uh, then we also do a little bit of buckwheat uh, if it's something we need a real quick cover crop in the middle of the summer. Um, but basically once we're getting ready to plant, um, we'll go ahead and mow the cover crop off. Uh, this year I purchased a chisel plow, um, so we'll go through and do that. Kind of breaks up the, the deeper layers of soil. <clears throat> it was something that I thought would be necessary because um, last year I actually ended up scaling up my tractors um, and we went up to a 75 horse that just does most of our field work besides the cultivation, um, uh, the weed cultivation. So it um, had a little bit more weight to it. So a chisel plow seemed like a good decision to kind of break up the soil a little bit and uh, relieve some of that compaction. Um, we also We'll go through with a disc right after that, depending on what kind of crop uh, was planted there prior. We'll either go one or two times. It's normally once, but sometimes in a really heavy rye crop, we'll end up having to go out there a second time. And then my favorite tool um, for actually preparing a seed bed, <coughs> as well as um, uh, kind of doing our uh, stale seed bedding is a perfective field cultivator. And that's made by Unbuffer. And um, I have a picture of it coming up here, um, but basically it's just a field cultivator. It's got a, um, a leveling bar on back. So whatever kind of soil it disrupts with its uh, S times in front kind of gets leveled out. Some of the clods get broke. And then uh, it's got a rolling basket on back, which um, the faster you go, the more it chops up and texturizes the soil. Uh, when we first started, we were just using a, a, a rototiller behind the tractor, and I was having a lot of trouble with uh, soil crusting. So I was uh, researching ways that we could kind of get the, the seed bed we needed, but not, uh, not pulverize it quite as bad as a tiller did, and kind of landed on this, and I've been very, very happy with the results. Um, so we'll, we'll take that. Usually I have to wait about a week or so after I disc. Um, if there's a lot of trash out in the field. So if it was a heavy uh, cover crop that isn't quite starting to die yet, uh, I have to wait a little bit. Um, but then we'll cultivate about every 10, uh, 10 to 14 days or whenever I'm out in the field. Uh, as, as many producers know, you're kind of out there all the time doing something um, and this implement's real easy to hook up and quick. So we'll go ahead and um, pass through that pretty much whenever we're out there just to kind of uh, do a little bit of stale seed bedding. And then uh, it's, it's just the hardest to do all of this kind of stuff in the spring, as, as many of you know. Um, we're just so many things going on. So the, the second step after kind of all the cover crops destroyed and um, we're ready to go, we um, are going to go ahead and go through with our uh, perfective field cultivators as often as we can, as I had mentioned. Um, usually I'll do this, so say on any given day I'll go out and disc. It's usually at least three to four weeks uh, in like a heavy cover crop before I can, um, you know, really get out there and use this cultivator the way I like. Um, otherwise, it, it'll still work, but depending on what the soil conditions are. If it's a little bit too wet and you know you have some big chunks of rye still uh, on the underside of, of the top layer of the soil that you can't see. Sometimes, um, as you can kind of tell on this, on this Perfecta, the, the tines are very close in the front, um, which I've kind of re-spaced them, which has helped a little bit, but um, they, they're just kind of tight. So if you have a lot of stuff in your soil, 
it, it can tend to clog up. So you kind of got to wait for your conditions to be right. Um, but once, once everything's kind of broke down, uh, for about four to six weeks before we plant, we'll go through with this, as I mentioned, about every 10 to 14 days. I like to go, you know, at least three or four times before I'm planting. Um, and, you know, I've, I've kind of struggled with the idea of, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't be out there disturbing my soil quite so much. But I, I noticed early on that the, the fields and the beds that I was doing this to, I was just getting a much better result um, from the crops that were grown in them, and much less weed pressure. And with this Perfecta, I'm grow driving at about six to seven miles an hour. So it's a pretty quick process. Um, I should mention, you know, we're a little bit smaller uh, in size with only being eight acres. So our fields, our rows are generally about 200 to 250 foot long at the longest. Um, so it's, it's quite a bit of turning, but it's a very quick process with this versus a rototiller where you're driving extremely slow um, to make sure that it's doing everything that it needs to. Um, uh, some people do like to use tine weeders um, in this for stale seed, bin it, stale seed bedding as well. I have just, for my system, the Perfecta is, is definitely the fastest. Uh, down here on the bottom, you can kind of see. So this was um, this past spring. This had a rye cover crop on it. Um, not a very big one. I would say it was probably only about, oh, six inches tall or so at the time of when it got mowed. Uh, it was just something that didn't grow quite as well. But um, this is the resulting soil. So as you can see, um, it's, it's definitely good enough to plant your transplants into, which is the majority of what we do. Um, well, we plant most, nearly all of our crops with a water wheel transplanter, the same as Andy does. Um, so that, that definitely gives you a good enough uh, place to plant any of those type of things. So then kind of step three in our system is just controlling the weeds in those crops um, that we couldn't kind of kill off on the front end by doing the stale seed bedding. Um, so my system is, is very, very simple. Uh, it used to be a little bit more complex than it is, and I'll, I'll kind of touch on that. But I basically can cultivate all of my crops with two cultivators. Um, so we use a Noble S time cultivator, which I picked up off of a farm around here, an old uh, corn farmer. I think the thing when I got it was maybe 16 foot long. So I cut it in half and um, just made it small so that it at a time for me. And as you can kind of see in the picture there, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, it's a very simple setup. Uh, each one of these is independent. So if the ground's a little bit uneven, they can kind of flex up and down as they need to. Uh, the S times work, you know, well when you're going quickly through the soil, they kind of chatter so that it breaks up that crust a little bit and then uh, does a, a pretty good job of destroying a little bit larger size weed than um, my Williams tool system that I got down here. But um, that is something that it, it seems to work pretty well in our system. We, everything in our larger fields we're planting. Um, on 30 inch rows basically. So um, I can pretty much any anything that we have out there I can cultivate with this um, in some way shape or form. So we'll go through with that first uh, on our first pass and then uh, generally after that we'll take our Williams tool system and Andy hit on this pretty well um, so I don't have a whole lot to add but as you can see yes each each one of these is um, you can set the tension on them. So that, that's kind of nice if you end up, um, I have pretty similar timing as Andy that about 10 days after a transplants in the ground, as long as it gets watered in well, uh, you can go ahead and take this out. But in a case that you couldn't, you could technically, and I, I do this from time to time, wherever your row is, you can actually pick up all those tines so that they're not touching the ground. And then, you know, if you, want the stuff 
you know, say in the middle where you don't have anything planted at all, if you want them really, really aggressive, you can set those to go a little bit deeper than the ones that are kind of closer um, to the row. But this tool, uh, so I, I bought it, I spent all the money on it. I pretty much got every option with it because I thought at the time that that was gonna be pretty much the only cultivator I would ever use or need. Um, and it's naive of me to, to think that would be all that I would need. But um, I, I basically purchased it. First couple times I went out with it, I really just didn't know how to use it to be completely honest. I just wasn't setting things aggressively enough or uh, driving fast enough. Um, I think that's probably, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I just didn't consider at first is how fast you should probably actually be driving some of these tools. And, and that's just a, a two-way thing where maybe you know you need to be driving a little bit faster, but at the, at the end of the day, if, if you're not confident in your skills, then if you drive too fast, you're going to start to hit your crops or you don't know what's happening behind you because this truly is a, a blind form of cultivation where I, I find I have better results if I don't look back at all because the minute you look back, you start to drift to the side a little bit. And even with these tines, if one of these tines is set pretty aggressively, and it, for example, you got some onions that have been in the ground for a couple weeks, and that one tine is really aggressively set on that row, and you get off just a little bit and it runs straight down that row, it can cause a little bit more damage than, than what it normally would. But in most instances, uh, the Williams tool system seems to, seems to do a pretty good job um, with, with all the tine weeding and things that I use it for. Um, the vegetable sweeps, um, which I'm glad the picture that Andy had looked a little, you can see them a little bit better. I use the 13 inch, uh, I think they call them pumpkin knives on the website. And I use those, um, those are the only ones I use, although I bought the other ones, um, but I use those whenever I cultivate um, any kind of squash, uh, sweet potatoes, or any kind of vining crop that's uh, mainly just one row. Seems to work pretty effective on that. Also the tines, you know, on like potatoes, I have hilling discs so I can actually hill the potatoes and weed at the same time, which is kind of nice. Um, but as, as we were saying, you got to be aggressive with it and it, timing is, is very key with this type of thing. Um, and it, it's also something you should probably consider your soil type. As you'll start to see in some of my pictures, we have a pretty nice uh, light black soil. So this particular implement works pretty well. If you had a lot of clay rocks, I just don't think it would probably work quite so well. Um, so those are pretty much my only um, main cultivators that I use that are on tractors. Uh, last year, I actually ended up selling, I had an Alice Chalmers G with a front mount cultivator that I thought would revolutionize the farm and I thought I could do all of my uh, weeding or most of my weeding with that. And basically what happened is, um, I, d I don't have a good picture of the layout of my farm, but the majority of my biggest production field, which is a little over six acres, is about three quarters of a mile down the road. And for anybody that's sat on a G, driven a G, they go about six miles an hour. So to, to drive all the way down there was just, it was not gonna happen. Uh, not to mention the gas tank small, and by the time you drove down there and back, you probably use half your gas. Um, they're not overly comfortable to sit on, and they just, to me, it just felt very awkward because I, I'm just used to sitting on, you know, a more normal size, normally, a normal oriented tractor. So um, when I purchased it, uh, I started to use it. I ended up having to put it on a trailer to transport it down to the field. And basically what ended up happening was it just wasn't convenient for me to use. So I ended up stopping using that. And uh, that I was basically to the point where it was either this G needs to work or the Williams tool system needs to work. And whichever one doesn't work is getting sold. And I started to use the Williams tool system, got a little bit more aggressive with it, sacrificed a couple crops to make sure I could learn how to use it correctly. 
and I uh, was was more than happy with the results. So the the G is is no longer. So I just use those two mainly. Um, in my smaller beds, so this is right outside my my door, basically at my house. Uh, until last year, I actually didn't grow around my home. It just wasn't overly convenient because of the way the land sits. But after doing some researching and and just kind of thinking about where I wanted the farm to be, it made a lot more sense to start to grow things uh, closer to home, uh, literally right outside the door and in shorter uh, beds. So these, these beds here are only about 30 foot long. Um, they're all basically hand managed. It, it actually is not a whole lot of work. Uh, one of the things I really like about it, so if you're, as all of you know, if you're picking green beans and you have a 200 foot row, and you just started and you look up and you see 200 feet, it, it, it can bring your morale down pretty quickly. Uh, one strategy I like to do is, you know, if I have a 200 foot row, I'll go 50 foot work backwards. So then I got a little chunk done and then I'll go down to the next 50 foot work back to the 50 foot I did. So you're always looking towards a shorter amount or what you've already done versus, oh no, I have 150 feet left. So. These short beds are kind of nice. Uh, the only thing that I don't like about them is I can't really do anything with a tractor on there, but that's the way it goes. Uh, so I just wanted to hit on a few of the hand tools we use. Um, a wheel hoe, so we'll do like our wheel paths uh, or our walking paths with the wheel hoes. Uh, collinear hoe is my favorite for precision weeding, um, which if you get onto like Johnny's websites, you can see that. I just, I didn't have a picture of all these, um, so I apologize for that. Um, but it's just a little, about five to six inch wide uh, or long blade that, um, you know, you just have, have a lot of control over it. It's got a very tall handle, so it's really easy to operate. It works really good on small weeds, not so much on anything, you know, larger than a, a couple inches. Although it will, it just, it's just not ideal for that. A stirrup hoe, um, we'll use those from time to time if something kind of gets out of hand. Tine rake is something that, since I ended up liking the tine weeder on the Williams tool system so much, I started to look at how I could uh, kind of use that on a smaller scale, um, especially like in our high tunnels and, and things like that. So this tine rake, um, we just have the very cheap version from Johnny's. Uh, I'm actually kind of looking at maybe getting one of the more, like the, I believe like the Two Bad Cats, I think is the, the brand or else. There's a couple other new ones that are coming out. Um, but I've just had such good luck uh, with my soil that um, I, I really do like the tine rakes um, for doing a lot of my light weeding. Uh, I got a question over here. If it weren't for the log logistics, do you feel that the G could have met your weeding needs? Um, I do. I do think it would have worked uh, pretty well. Uh, but like I said, since I had the Williams tool system already, it just kind of came down to, you know, I, I, I just really wanted one of the two. I didn't, didn't think I needed both of them around. Uh, the, the really nice thing about the G um, is that everything is in front of you. So as you're sitting there, you can see your rows, you can see exactly where your tool placement is, when you make a correction. So if you're drifting a little bit to the left and you correct it, it instantly happens and it, it happens, you know, in accordance with the row, whereas if the, the tool is behind you and you start to drift to the right and you overcorrect a little bit too much, you're just basically going to move the, the back end over and it's going to swipe out, you know, part of your row, which um, you can probably see from time to time out at the farm if I get a little bit off. But um, overall, I do think, I think it would work well if it has the right cultivators for, for your particular system. And that was the other thing that um, I knew if I kept the G, I, it was very specific to what could go on that tractor to use. I can't, it doesn't have a three point, so I couldn't just, if, if that broke down, then my weeding broke down. Whereas right now, if, if my, uh, that little blue Ford breaks down, you know, I got a couple other tractors that I could hook up and then still, you know, pretty much get my, my, uh, my cultivation done. 
How do you keep your rows parallel? I am just a very good driver. <laughs> there's, there's, I don't really have much else to say. Um, I just, uh, you know, it's, it's these small rows here that we're looking at on this picture, that is all just by hand. Um, so I'll go out there. And, uh, these beets were actually planted with a paper pot transplanter. So I just pull the paper pot through the, the soil and it plants everything for me. The lettuce, um, what we actually do, so once that was tilled, I have a rake that I just put a couple clamps on and I'll walk down the length of it and then I'll just do a cross all the way back and it'll make a grid and that's where everything gets planted for the, the hand transplant stuff. If it's out in the big fields, um, then what we're doing is so if it's direct seeded, I'll use my root um, just so I get that really nice fine seed bed. Um, and that tiller has some markers that I welded onto it that will make uh, however many rows I need. Otherwise, I'm using the water wheel transplanter, which is about 95% of what I'm planting, just transplants with the water wheel transplanter. And when you do that, if you basically start with a straight line, it's, it's pretty easy to keep it going. I'll just overlap my wheel tracks um, and the, uh, the water wheel does the rest basically. So mulch options, I'll hit on these real quick. I know I'm probably getting pretty close to being done on time. Uh, so the mulch options. So uh, my biggest field is non-irrigated. So six acres, I basically just hope and pray for rain a lot of the times. <laughs> and that is why I've kind of uh, yep, looks like I got five minutes. Uh, so that's why I've kind of um, changed what I grow in that large field. I grow generally grow things that I can normally grow without much uh, excess water, other than you know the rain that I get. So like our garlics down there, um, onions. I have a pretty good luck with growing on a large large area like that. Um, potatoes, um, and some people do end up irrigating these. I've just been, been very, very lucky, I think, that I haven't had to do that too much. Um, and then the other nice thing with the water wheel is, so if, if I know that I'm not going to get rain for a few days, I'll just up the water at the time of planting. So then pretty much guaranteed with that water wheel, as long as you get the plants in the ground, got enough water, it, it's generally enough to get them set to the point where they can withstand a little bit of, you know, like a week or I don't, just kind of depends on the conditions, but you, it buys you a little bit of time that you don't need irrigation on it. Uh, do you use the tine rake on top of the lettuce when the lettuce is young? Yeah, so the, the tine weeders um, rake versus the, the actual one that goes on the back of the tractor, I get pretty aggressive with it. I probably use it a little bit longer than I should, um, and it, it will kind of ruffle up the leaves a little bit, but I, I haven't ever had an issue that it's, it's um, caused any problem. Uh, the only thing that I do notice is uh, with the tine rake, the handheld one, the tines are so close that it just doesn't physically allow much bigger than a you know two to three inch lettuce plant to pass through. And that's part of the reason why I want to invest in maybe a, a nicer tine rake. Uh, so oat straw, uh, is, is pretty much the main thing I use. I have used ryegrass, works pretty well. I just notice you have to put it on a little bit higher rate because um, the particular ryegrass that I was getting um, is just not, wasn't chopped up as fine. So you just had to kind of watch it with that. Uh, I've started to use the black woven ground fabric. It's a little bit extra work. Uh, these tomatoes here are actually planted on that. It's a little bit extra work, but I do like it because it tends to, um, uh, you know, it, it's just stronger and you can use it for a couple seasons. Um, but it is a little bit more work to lay out and then you need landscape pins rather than just soil to hold it down. Um, but last year was kind of my first year really experimenting with it. And I, it I did like it. Uh, it's, it's nice to be able to reuse it a few seasons. Um, and then the, with the oat straw and the rye, the nice thing is it leaves some organic matter and it seems to hold moisture, you know, much, much better when we actually get a little bit of rain. So just a few things to consider. Uh, so we got 
up here, you can kind of see our soil type. It's got a little bit of sand in it. But so these, uh, these onions here, basically from the time they were rooted in good enough that I could use a tine weeder, I was going out with a tine weeder once, if not twice a week, if I could. Um, to kind of keep those weeds down. You'll see a few weeds here and there, but um, overall had a really nice onion crop with uh, very little weeds. Uh, here on the squash, this is where I'll use uh, those pumpkin knives. And basically once these vine out to where they're out where my wheels are going, that's usually about the last pass that I'll take. And it'll cut all the way under all the vines until you know, you're about three, four inches off the actual stem on each side and it also hills some soil in there and basically if you can do that so when i do that last pass i am running over some of the vines but if you can do that um, generally the next time you would need to go out those vines have completely covered this area to where the weeds aren't germinating um, so i've had really good luck uh, growing all of my squash the, and sweet potatoes all of those vining crops the last uh, two, two, three years, I haven't used any kind of mulch on them and they had very good success uh, just using the cultivators that I have. Um, but yes, timing is key. Uh, you can't have the soil, it can't be too wet, otherwise the weeds kind of just stay in a clump in that soil and then they don't tend to die very quickly or at all. Um, and then for me, I'll use uh, you know the S time to get the, the larger weeds and it also hills up soil around the crops. And then I'll take the tine weeder out. So generally I'm, I'm making a couple passes, which for me, it ends up working out because I think I get some pretty good weed control out of it. Um, but yes, you just need to be aggressive with it. And I, I always, my big thing is I'm, I'm not scared to try something out. Uh, yes, it does cost money. But generally, if, if you've been doing this, you're probably putting in your, your research and you're not just going and buying things because you can. Um, maybe if it's a really good deal and you want to go buy it, you will. But for the most part, you're putting your, your time and research in. And at the end of the day, you know, if it's not something that's going to work, then you just go ahead and get rid of it. You can sell it, um, do whatever. You might lose some money. Um, but in the long run, if, for me, if I don't try the tools out that I think I need, I really can't grasp whether it's gonna work for me or not. So I got lucky and didn't have to buy too many things before I found something that, uh, that worked out for me. But here's a few pictures, uh, some of our fields, um, mostly brassicas, I guess, in these pictures. I'll see if these work. Uh, these are the last couple slides. So this is that Perfecta in action. Um, hopefully, hopefully you can see it. So the, the picture for me is really good. I don't know if it is for you or not. Um, I, you can kind of see I have really deep furrows here, which I ended up adjusting and that doesn't happen anymore. But uh, you can see from the action that the, the rolling basket has when you're moving, it's really chopping that soil up and it actually, it, it packs it down just a little bit too. And it makes enough variation in the heights of the soil that when it rains, you don't get a nasty crust on top. Um, and you can see how fast I was going in that. So, I mean, you can do this. This is probably about eight pass, six, six to eight passes right here. And it's just taken a few minutes, so it's, it's no big deal. And then this is the tine weeder in action. So this is on some really young onions. You can kind of see, you just go pretty quick and they're fine. That was the biggest thing for me is I was just always scared that I was killing everything off. And, and once I finally realized that that thing was actually you know, doing what it was supposed to, and that it, it, it really does have a hard time ripping out larger crops, unless there was something that disturbed the root system, um, which one year it actually helped me determine that I had some uh, onion root maggots, because I was going through and the onions were just coming out right behind me, and I discovered that I had a little bit of an insect problem, 
Um, and then on the flip side, the one bad thing about a tying weeder though is if your crops aren't set, you will end up just basically ripping them all out. So you just have to be a little bit careful on that. But that is it for what I got there. And yeah, let's take some questions. Awesome. Thank you both. Well, we'll open it up to questions for um, either of the presenters. Um, go ahead and use that chat box. So to access the chat box, if you haven't already, you just need to hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen and then the black toolbar will pop up and you hit the chat icon and uh, ask away. One of the questions I had, Andy, um, you know, you talked about reaching out for expert advice. Do you have any suggestions of good places or people to go to? Like, what are the resources that would, you know, f fill that uh, function? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I would say it kind of depends on your personality. I am one of those people that I hate email a lot. And the idea of going and like, subs like some of my farmer friends really like to subscribe to like all the, the horticultural, you know, email listservs and things like that. And the idea of getting that in my inbox every day is not something I want to do. So my, my tendency is just to find those like one or two people that I, I trust in this. And then I kind of just say, you know, hey, if I have some questions, can I ask you? Um, some people have really good luck with, you know, the, the listservs and putting ideas out there. And some people, you know, they really like to go to the conferences. Some people like to have a farming mentor. Um, you know, the Labor for Learning program through PFI is an example of, of something along that vein. Um, it kind of, you just need to figure out what fits your personality type. Sure. Um, some of us are extraordinarily um, introverted and we'd rather suffer the pain of goofing it up and figure, figuring it out on our own than having to ask anybody. And I guess that's okay too. Mm -hmm. And if anyone in the, you know, attending tonight has any input on that type of question, feel free to put that in the chat box as well. So I guess uh, you two can field these next two questions that just came in. Yeah, I'll, uh, I can go here real quick. Um, so the, the first question was, if we can assume climate change is here to stay and planting cultivating windows continue to get tighter, uh, what would your top three go-to tools be for killing weeds? Um, you know, so quite honestly, for me, I don't think a whole lot of things would change. Um, one thing that I am doing <clears throat> is I'm, I'm definitely moving more crops under protection. Um, so as I said, I got three high tunnels and I don't really see an end in sight on those. I had really good luck with this uh, homemade build. I was originally kind of um, scared that it wouldn't be able to hold up to the wind, but um, I think I reinforced it enough that it, it's, it's going to help a lot. And then obviously, if, if you're growing under cover like that, it, it's going to open up your window as to when you can do all of these different things. Um, as far as, you know, outdoor stuff, I did notice that this, you know, 2019, well, all these years, it seems like we have a problem every summer or every spring with things being too wet or too cold. Um, but for me, um, that Perfecta field cultivator really was a game changer because when those conditions are right, I can get out there and do things very quickly versus with a tiller, um, if the conditions aren't right and it's they're not right more often with a tiller, in my opinion, than with that Perfecta. Because of the Perfecta, I mean, I this uh, last fall, uh, is we just, it was so wet and I had to get out there to get the garlic field ready. Um, and it wasn't any conditions that I would normally drive in, um, but it had to be done. And I ended up taking that Perfect out there and quite honestly, it was some of the nicest soil I had ever turned over with a cultivator. I couldn't really believe that it, it wasn't clumping like it normally would. My wheel tracks were, were dissolving. You couldn't really tell where I had been driving. Um, and I know that to be not the case with a tiller, especially those two spots where your wheels are and those wheel tracks where that tiller will turn that stuff up if it's wet and you get those big clods of dirt right there generally. 
Um, so with this Perfecta, that really eliminated that, and that's, that's allowed me with these tighter windows, I can get out there and do things uh, really quickly. Uh, and then to the second question with the guide cones, I have not. I, I'm pretty sure that, it, yeah, so with the guide cones, I, I don't know if that's, that might be different than their, uh, their quote-unquote GPS system for the Williams tool system. But um, I had called Market Farm because I was interested in trying something out like that. And they actually said that they had discontinued all of those things and that basically um, your guidance system was overlapping your wheel track. Yeah, I, I have not, I've not used that either. And that, that uh, Williams tool system, like TD said, once you get pretty good at driving straight, you can you can do as long as you're you have nerves of steel when you're getting up to speed and starting. Like I can I can drive in road gear over a crop now without even getting my heart rate up. Um, you know, you just got you get used to it, and it's really it's not. You get comfortable with where you are, and you very rarely make those mistakes. And when you do, it's usually because you're trying to drink coffee or pay attention to something else. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, one one thing I'll add to that real quick with uh, the Williams tool system is is yeah, the, when I was unhappy with it, it was because I was driving so slow. And when you do drive slow and you have those tines set aggressively, you will start to rip things out of the ground because they have a longer contact with the crop that they can have that time to actually kind of pull it from the ground. Whereas when you're driving, you know, seven eight miles an hour over type of stuff it just doesn't have enough time to grab on anything to really disturb it so it leaves all of those taller crops but the the very small little thread stage weeds cannot handle that so um, that was one thing that I noticed and once I got over that fear which I mean I'm not gonna lie it took me a couple of years to really get over that fear completely but once I did do that it, it was a much more effective tool that uh, is my favorite weeding tool now whereas it was almost on the on the cell uh, or on the pile that was going to go to the auction for sale. So. Do we have any other questions from attendees? I have one for you, TD. Um, you talked about leaving your fabric mulch, or you talked about fabric mulch, but do you leave that after the season or do you pull it up? And if you pull it up, how do you do that? Um, so this year it was my, or 2019 was my first year using it. I actually did leave it out in the field. So we'll see what happens. Um, I, I've gone out there a couple times and it doesn't seem like anything's wrong with it. I mean, obviously it can break down probably a little bit quicker if it's, you know, exposed to all that. Uh, the beds that I do pull out, that's, it's somewhat of, somewhat I don't know if it's more work or not than, than plastic if you have you know a plastic remover then that would probably make life a lot easier but for me taking plastic out was like the worst thing in the world and was one of the reasons why I quit using it all together was just because I made the mistake one year of I planted a white clover in between my rows of plastic and then that rooted the plastic down and then to fix that, I basically took a disc over it to try and loosen it a little bit. And then I just couldn't ever get all the little pieces of plastic out of there. So um, I just had a bad experience with it a few times. And with my large field being non-irrigated, it just, I couldn't use it down there anyway. So um, I wanted to switch to this because uh, the ground fabric, it allows moisture in. Uh, which I thought would be kind of nice. Um, and it just seems to be, I have two big black labs, they're each about 100 pounds, and they will walk all over that plastic, and I just was having problems with it getting destroyed. The wind would get in it. Uh, so I haven't noticed any of those issues with this fabric. This is when you uh, go to remove it, you have to pull all those pins out. So it, I basically just take a, a pair of vice grips or a pair of pliers, uh, and walk down the row and I'll pull all those pins out, um, which can be reused, which is nice. And then I'll actually just, uh, as long as there's no uh, crap residue or anything on the fabric, you can just roll it right back up. Um, and then I'll just mark where it was that I know the length roughly so that I can reuse it in the same areas. Yeah, 
if I'm not leaving it out in the field. Okay, thanks. And then Andy, you've got a question from Laura. She's asking, or she said, are you saying that you can cultivate the garlic mid-spring through the hay mulch? Is it rotten enough by then? No, that, that photo that I showed was just an example of how you can set up a cultivating tractor. If I, that was from a number of years ago, if my memory serves me, we actually didn't mulch that garlic crop at all because of the way the fall weather was. Um, typically, if we're mulching, we don't, we don't have to cultivate it at all. It's just making sure stuff comes up and, and through the straw mulch. Yeah, as far as garlic goes on my end, um, we, we don't pull the mulch off either. Um, one year, so I, I, had, I had normally always used oat straw and had really good luck with it. And then one year, I kind of just didn't have any access to it. So I used uh, the ryegrass for mulch. And that's when I discovered you need to put that stuff on a little bit heavier. Because what the, the straw mulch, when it's baled, you know, the combine had chewed it up and the straws, you know, maybe six to seven, eight inches long uh, each piece, whereas the ryegrass was cut at full height right before it seeded out. So um, when you go to spread that out, you know, it's, it's just not as compact, not as dense. So we had a lot of weed trouble that year in our garlic when we used that versus the uh, oat straw. So then once we switched back to this oat straw, I, I noticed a lot less weed pressure. Um, but yeah, there was, I have, I guess I've just never seen the reason to pull the mulch off unless for some reason the garlic looks like it's not gonna poke through. Um, but usually that just means the mulch was a little bit too heavy in a couple spots. So you kind of just rake it out a little bit. But for all the work I do to mulch it all, I just, I like to leave it out there. Do we have any last questions from anyone? One last call. I will say that um, next week we have um, a PhD student from Iowa State and then Sam Bennett, a row crop farmer in Iowa. They'll be talking about rye cover crops and using them on uh, corn and soy systems. So if cover crops is something you're generally interested in, you wanna learn more about rye, next week you'll be able to tune in for a little more additional information um, in that realm of topics. Yeah, I, I guess one additional thing, having listened to you, your talk, TD, and talking about using the Perfecta, um, I, I don't have the experience with that. I actually think some of the, like the improvement in your soil is probably that you've increased your soil organic matter um, through the usage of cover crops and, uh, and the spreading of mulch. And that, because uh, we found kind of the same thing as, as our soils improved, even though the windows for tillage might be narrowing in general, uh, a three inch rain event in my first few years, if I went in and tilled in like 10 days, it was a disaster. And as our soils have gotten better now, we could get a three inch rain and I might be able to till even four days later if the soil's warm enough. Um, and so I, I think sometimes we're like that crusting a lot of times is also indicative of either your calcium being out of whack or just low soil organic matter levels. And so my suspicion is you've, you've improved your soil enough that you're, you're just making everything for yourself easier. I definitely agree. Um, yeah, when I had first started, uh, the, the main field that I was growing in, you know, was, uh, it was a corn field and not a very well treated one at that. So, um, I definitely, I've seen the, the difference when I very first got into that field, there was a, a, basically a sandbar out there that has since you can't even tell that it exists. It's all been worked in and all of the organic matter increases have seemed to, to really help. But I think, you know, it's, it's definitely all each each piece of the puzzle kind of gets you closer to the end but it uh there's definitely a lot of factors that go in and i can't definitely can't say for sure that the perfecta is the difference but i can say for sure that per perfecta or um you know basically getting rid of the rototiller has definitely increased my um or well decreased the time that i need to spend getting the soil ready 
I've been very happy with those results. I can do things so much quicker and you know, it doesn't seem like much, but it's, I don't have to hook up PTO, which for anybody that's hooked up PTO shaft can sometimes be a little bit annoying, especially on tillers. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, Andy, do you want to give a plug for your equipment that you're going to be uh, putting up for sale and let people? Okay. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll end up putting something out on Facebook and on our website. Uh, we'll do it when we're ready. So if folks um, are asking questions about individual pieces or something like that, I, I may not be responsive to that just because we've had a lot of inquiries so far. Um, but we'll, we'll have that up and out in the next couple of weeks, and it'll be public, so nobody's going to have to worry about missing out. Um, and we'll, we'll likely have a listing of the pieces that we're going to sell, and hopefully you can hook yourself up with some useful things. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I think we'll sign out for the night. TV, Andy, thank you very much for taking the time tonight to share all of your insight. And thank you to all the attendees that logged in and stuck around.